Okay, I'm just going to talk about gear. So it's basically how to get from the outside of the patient to the lesion, but we're going to not talk about anything to do with the lesion. So rather than do a bunch of pretty pictures and show and tell and ooh and ah, I'd rather have each of you think about uh, difficult cases that you might have done and how some of this might have uh, applied to that case to make your life easier. So I have no disclosures. So this is really about choosing the right tool for the job. Um, and this is a very appropriate picture because sometimes if you choose the wrong tool, you can still make it work, but it's not without quite a bit of effort. So it might be easier to just choose the round peg the first time around. The obligate Sitaroism quotes for this by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And something a little bit more temporal from Russell Wilson, the separation is in the preparation. So this is really about trying to make your life easy. Uh, and when you come into a case, you want to be efficient and effective, and you don't want to set yourself up for a long day. So the gear we're going to talk about today is everything from starting to the lesion, including access sheets, guides, extensions, wires, microcatheters. And then we can leave the algorithms for treating lesions for future discussion. So access is the first thing that we do. And I'm a huge proponent of ultrasound. Everybody should know how to use it. It's acknowledged that this is best practice, especially for femoral cases, but also for radial cases. Anytime you're worried about spasm, poor pulse, complex issues, with the radial, the first stick is your best chance. And the best way to get your first stick in is by an ultrasound. So I've been doing this for 25 years and I've gotten pretty good without ultrasound because we didn't have it, but I'm better with ultrasound. Um, for all access, we really use micropuncture needles and that means we're using small, tiny wires. It's very important to visualize these wires uh, in the groin when they go in because there are a number of small branches that the wire can easily go off into without any significant resistance, but will not accommodate a six French sheath without rupture. So in terms of sheaths, um, there's two kinds. There's hydrophilic sheaths, which have a lubricious coating, which is activated by liquid, blood, saline, et cetera, that we use typically for radial and brachial access because of the spasm risk. And the spasm risk is also related to the sheath to artery ratio. The larger the size of the sheath to the artery, the more likely you are to have access difficulties in spasm. In most humans, the radial artery is around three to four millimeters. In some petite individuals, it may be smaller at two millimeters. In diabetics, it actually may be very calcified and small. Uh, and again, this is where ultrasound is helpful. Uh, in larger people, you can have very large radial arteries. I remember distinctly a large roto I did through the radial artery with a nine French sheath. So it's just the sheath to artery ratio. Not only access sheaths can provide you with a significant amount of support. So long sheaths buttress your catheters and your guides very well. And you can think about putting a long sheath in is similar to taking an eight French guide instead of a six French guide. They're also helpful in negotiating tortuosity and allowing you to transmit the torque to the catheter tip, making engagement and maneuvering easier. Um, and one of the things that um, we should remember is the relationship between the wire and the sheath. So if you put a very soft and floppy wire in like uh, a nitrix wire and you're putting a stiff eight sheath in, um, your sheath is much stiffer than the wire. You have to be very careful and watch it. Um, so in a usual progression, if you have significant disease, tortuosity and difficulty, you know, I would take a micropuncture kit, put in a four French dilator, take a glide wire. You can put a glide catheter over that and through the glide catheter, then you can put your favorite stiff wire.
and then use a long hydrophilic sheath. And that's an easy way to get up very difficult and tortuous femoral anatomy. Um, there's a Jeopardy question here with the sheath size and the French color indicators below. But as the sheaths get larger, the inner diameter gets larger and you can accommodate more gear. In terms of sheath length, this is a nice diagram uh, from Mono's book uh, showing that the typical short sheath ends uh, in the uh, internal to common iliac around the uh, halfway up. A 25 centimeter sheath usually is long enough to get you through iliac tortuosity. And if you have aortic tortuosity, a 45 centimeter sheath, and that also will give you a significantly increased push. There are similar sheath links now we can use for the radial artery uh, with the destination slender, which come in 65 and 75 centimeter lengths that can obviate a great deal of uh, subclavian and innominate and even some aortic tortuosity and similarly will give you extreme guide support uh, when doing radial procedures. So the guide catheter diameter goes up about 0 0.01 per French. Uh, five French catheters are really kind of uh, a niche item. Uh, there are a number of people who pride themselves in using five French catheters. Uh, but you seldom need to use anything that small. Uh, they're very flimsy, uh, limited support, uh, and limited options. Six French has really become the standard because of a balance of all the options between catheter shape, size, pushability, and accommodation of gear. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot, however, is bifurcation stents. And if you're going to have two balloons that are three, five or larger, sometimes getting them through a six French sheath, especially if there's any tortuosity as the sheath goes through, can be very hard to pull these out, leading to loss of wire position and unhappy outcomes. Uh, so sometimes a seven French is preferable when you're knowing about a bifurcation up tight. Um, Six French, you can use the CSI atherectomy device. You can use a 1.5 roto. I wouldn't recommend a 1.75, although you can absolutely squeeze it in there, but it's extremely tight. Uh, and the lasers, the seven French, you can use a 1.75 roto up to the 1.7 laser. Um, the brachycatheter will fit. Uh, but it's not preferable uh, because if you get a stall with a withdrawal, that becomes an emergency. So I would not recommend seven French uh, for brachytherapy, except for very unusual situations. Uh, the eight French uh, is typically femoral, although can be used radial if you have a large artery. Um, you can fit uh, larger rotos to 215, the largest laser. Um, and you can also fit an IVIS and a microcatheter to facilitate uh, IVIS guided wiring. Uh, nine Frenches, we don't have many of them. So if you're needing a nine French uh, for extreme sizes of roto, I don't think I've used a 225 in probably well over a decade, maybe two. Uh, or if you have trifurcations where you need to fit two stents and perhaps a balloon in, uh, but you need to plan ahead for those. And I don't think we have any more 10 or 12 French sheaths that we used to use for the DCA. Um, guide catheters, sorry. Um, there's a, an iPhone app, if you're curious, complex PCI solutions, which will give you sheath sizes, gear sizes, and compatibility. Uh, but I think this is something that most of us know just from experience. Um, but you can add up the diameters, and if they're less than the diameter by a little bit, they generally will fit. The length of the guide catheters, the 100 centimeter guide catheter is standard. Um, Multipurposes come 110 and occasionally 120. Um, the extra long catheters are 120. Uh, we typically don't have guides in that length except for JR4 and JL4. 
uh, once in a while an odd size. Um, and then the 90 centimeter guides uh, we use when we do CTOs with externalization of wires, just so that we have a long enough wire rail, um, and especially so that the retrograde gear uh, can go through the guide catheter or through the heart and then reach the osteum of the other guide catheter to allow uh, retrograde wiring. Um, there is a YouTube video, I believe this is Monos, which uh, shows you how to cut a guide catheter to make it from 100 down to 110. Uh, it's a fairly simple process to do, but it does narrow the inner diameter of that guide catheter a little bit. Um, you have to be careful if you're using sixes, especially uh, that the inner diameter between where your guide has been cut and the sheath connector is a little bit tight and should be thought of as a French size smaller. Uh, the support of the guide catheter is really dependent on the diameter of the guide catheter. So the French size and the length of the sheath can have a great impact. So 45 centimeter sheaths from the groin, 90 centimeter sheaths from the groin, if you use destinations or a 65, 75 from the radial can greatly increase your support. Um, there's two kinds of guide support. One is passive. And that just relies on the stiffness of the guide. It just sits at the ostium of the coronary. And the only support that you get is intrinsic to the guide catheter. So those are typically the Judkins, uh, the IMAs, the ARs, and that kind of uh, issue. Active guide support relies on opposite wall push. So the extra backup guides, the Judkins curve left, uh, the XBs uh, and the AL guides typically supply this. Uh, you may have seen people take a JR4 and counter clock and basically screw it into the right coronary artery so that the back of the guide is off the back wall. So basically you're effectively taking a passive guide and making it active support. Uh, for the fellows out there, um, one way you can think about this is the difference between a Jackie and a TIG. So when you put a Jackie in the left coronary, it's just the passive guide. And if you inject hard, frequently the guide bumps and backs out of the left main. If you take a Jackie, it's uh, put in by going down off the opposite wall and cusp and pushing it into the coronary. And when you inject, the, the catheter is backed up by opposite aortic wall support and doesn't back out. So that's a nice way to think of that. There is a trade-off between safety and support. So obviously the more push and force you have on the guide going into the coronary artery, the greater the likelihood is that you can cause injury to that artery. Uh, so all benefits have trade-offs and risks. So what you want to assess is really the the angle and takeoff of the coronary ostia. Usually they're relatively horizontal, uh, but as people age and aortic shapes change or coronary anomalies, you can have upgoing, downgoing, horizontal and bizarre slit-like takeoffs. You also want to think about the landing zone of the guide. So if you have a critical osteal right coronary, it's not typically a good case to take an AL guide because that guide is going to injure that lesion in its landing zone. It'd be much better to take a JR4 guide that won't deeply intubate through that osteal lesion. Uh, typically, shorter guides with more curve engage the upward takeoff, so an EBU3 or a downgoing takeoff, you might take a little bit longer guide like an EBU4. Um, there are uh, various ways of getting in long guides so that you can get extra support if there's no osteal disease, even if you might take any, for example, an EBU35, if you take a four and actually 
take the back end of the wire to straighten out the uh, primary curve. Uh, sometimes you can engage, you just have to be very gentle and very careful and absolutely make sure that you have outstanding pressure waveforms before you inject anything. A lot of times I will even wire the coronary before injecting and back it out a little bit to make absolutely certain uh, that there is minimal chance for any coronary injury. The important thing about a guide catheter uh, when you're doing interventions is the shape that engages may not be the best shape to do the procedure. So even though a JR4 engages very easily into the right coronary, if you're going to need a lot of push and support, it may be worth taking the extra time up front uh, to get an AL1 guide in to give you the support that you need to finish the case with some ease. Um, the major disadvantage of radial procedures is actually the angle of the guide and the lack of support compared to six French femoral. Um, so the ways that you can augment radial force and push is to actually upsize your guide as we discussed, use seven French instead of six French and even use a long destination slender sheath to improve your support. Um, the sheathless guides are larger, um, but because of the soft nature of the guides and their hydrophilicity, I personally found them a little bit less support unless you go to the, uh, the largest seven and a half French. Um, and this is just a schematic to kind of compare sheathless guides with uh, standard guides. Uh, so if you take a, a seven and a half French OCATH guide here, the inner diameter is about 2.5. Um, it's almost the same as an eight French standard guide. Um, in terms of guide catheters, it's not only about the shape, um, but it's also the vectors of push. And a lot of you will remember, uh, it's been very difficult. You're trying to get into the circ and cross the left main stent, and you push the guide in, you get super support and backup from the aorta, and you just can't get that balloon to make the U-turn. Um, but that's because the vectors are wrong and the guide is pushing up. If you pull that guide back, and point it down, sometimes the balloon will go much easier. Uh, so this is kind of illustrating the vector of the guide here is different from the vector of the push that you want to get. There are different ways to fix that. Uh, you can use a buddy wire, uh, you can use a guide extension, or you can change the shape or position of the guide in the aorta. So this illustrates that circ where your guide is pushing up, but you want to go down. So if you pull the guide up, your vector is better directed. And then if you use a guide extension, um, your vector is even better. Um, so this is an example of the Judkins, how we kind of take the wire, uh, back it up, uh, curl it around and push it in. So there's the, it's very difficult to see, but this is an EBU guide here that was initially prolapsed here. The wire came down, pushed the tip down and it engaged. We talked about how to lower your risk of aggressive guide position, but the important thing is never to inject without a clear undampened waveform, soft, slow injections, you can back the guide out over a guide wire. Always be aware of where your guide catheter is and where your distal wire is. Uh, and this will help prevent both distal wire perforations and guide dissections. Um, many times this involves a larger field of view than we typically use for a lot of cases. If you're very concerned, sometimes you can put a second wire out the guide 
into the aortic cusp and use it as a bumper wire. This is a way that sometimes we can do osteo lesions to make sure we don't get longitudinal stent deformation. Um, the other thing that you can do is uh, use a, a buddy wire. So you can wire a conus on the right or an RV marginal, or you can wire both the LAD and the circumflex uh, to stabilize the guide. Uh, and similar to getting the guide in, uh, using your coronary wires to back the guide out uh, will prevent any guide injury on withdrawal. This is especially important with uh, aggressive guide positions. And when you pull the guide up, sometimes the guide will dive in to the inferior portion of the artery, injuring it. Um, we have a number of instances when you can't pass a radial guide because of either tortuosity or what's called a razor edge, where the edge of the guide is very uh, apart from the wire that goes through it. And that loose area can actually catch uh, vessels and cause injury and then spasm. Uh, you can telescope the guide. Uh, what we typically do here is take a, a Terumo 125 centimeter four French angled guide. This greatly reduces that razor edge, but does not eliminate it. Um, we had a nice case at the VA last week where we tried the angle glide. It did not work because the patient still had tortuosity. We could not get the guide up. Um, but then with balloon assisted tracking, uh, it was like a hot knife through butter. It just flew right through. Um, the way to do this is to pass a coronary wire through the guide up the radial artery. You then take a two and a half by 20 millimeter balloon, half in and half out of the guide, uh, inflate it to six atmospheres and just move the guide and the balloon as a unit. Uh, the balloon eliminates any edge of the guide and also acts as a lubricious dilator to lead the guide through. In terms of support for the guide, we've talked about uh, getting a larger guide and more aggressive, but we mentioned the buddy wire. Um, the wiggle wire is a wire that has sinusoidal shape uh, to the distal 20 centimeters of the wire. It's typically uh, put in through a microcatheter and the microcatheter is withdrawn. This exposes that sinusoidal curve to the inside of the artery, gripping the artery uh, and helping the wire stay there and supporting your guide. Um, you can use an anchor wire. So you can put a wire in the same vessel in a side branch. Uh, you can put it in a different vessel, circ, a ramus, or an LAD. Um, an anchor wire can also be used when you have placed a bifurcation stent uh, and trapped a wire in the wall. Uh, that will often help anchor your guide for recrossing a stent and you can then remove the uh, trapped wire before you do your high pressure dilation. Uh, one caution I would say is not to trap a wire between two stents. Um, that can be a recipe for disaster, especially in highly calcified vessels, um, but between a stent and an arterial wall is typically safe, except in the most calcified tortuous vessels. Um, you can also put a balloon over a second wire. Uh, so you can put two wires in the vessel, put an anchor balloon distally, uh, take a semi-compliant balloon to two to four atmospheres, uh, and that will add sufficient traction sometimes to deliver your gear. Uh, you can put it in a branch of the same vessel, in a diagonal, a conus, or an RV marginal branch or you can put it in another vessel entirely. Um, and then the other thing that you can use is a guide extension. Uh, and I think we've all inchwormed them down over balloons. And then you can use a combination of all of these things. You can use a, a wiggle wire as a buddy wire and then anchor it in another vessel with a balloon. Um, but there is a, a number of combinations and permutations. So this is just some graphics depicting what an anchor balloon in another branch would be to increase your push here. This is a distal anchor uh, 
so you put the balloon distally and helps deploy your gear. You have to remember that if you're going to place a stent and you have a distal anchor balloon, you need to remove that balloon before you deploy the stent. Uh, guide extensions, we've talked a little bit about. The important thing to note about guide extensions is they do reduce your lumen size by about one French. Um, the inchworm technique is just to in inflate an anchor balloon distally, bring the guide extension to the edge of the balloon, deflate the balloon, and then advance the guide extension over the deflated balloon. It's important to remember that these guide extensions are functionally a wire with a piece of equipment on the end. And you have to avoid wire wraps or make sure you keep your working wire and the guide extension wire separated by a towel or a gauze or some sort. Um, you can actually use uh, telescoping guide extensions. So you can have an eight French guide with an eight French guide extension through that, with a six French guide extension to that. Um, so you can greatly increase your deliverability and force by doing that. Um, there are other things guide extensions are useful for. Um, if you need to deliver just a few cc's of contrast to minimize your contrast distally, uh, you can use them for selective contrast delivery. This is always a little bit dicey, because you absolutely have to make completely certain that you have an excellent waveform. Uh, and if you use a six French extension and an eight French guide, your waveform is going to reflect the difference between those in the aortic pressure, not what's happening in the distal wire extension. Guide extensions are also helpful to advance to trapped equipment, giving you more pull force to reverse. Uh, they can facilitate reverse cart and CTOs. Uh, you can plug a vessel when you're working antegrade to reduce any kind of subintimal hematoma expansion when you're doing antegrade dissection reentry. And they've also been used for uh, suction thrombectomies distally. Uh, this is just a schematic for guide extensions and gear uh, that you can refer to later. Uh, the Increased push of your gear uh, varies with vector and support. So the further that you have your guide extension in, uh, the more stable it is uh, and the better you'll have in terms of push. Uh, so if you're trying to get around a bend, it will be helpful to put a balloon up at the bend, inchworm the guide extension around the bend and get coaxial will give you your best support. Um, there are several guide extensions out there, uh, Telescope, Guidezilla, and Guideliner. Uh, that was the initial one. The Guideliner also has a variation called a trap liner, uh, which is a guide extension here, uh, but it also has a trapper balloon to facilitate exchanging of equipment. Um, the Trapper balloon is not a guide extension, but is simply a balloon on a stick um, that can be used to facilitate exchange of equipment over monorail wires. Um, the important thing to remember is this balloon is kind of bulky, and when you withdraw it, it frequently does entrain air into the guide, so it is really mandatory to bleed back after you've used a trap balloon within the guide to make sure you've purged all the air appropriately. So now that we've gotten all our access and we're ready to go, we have to choose the right guide wire. So guide wires are really the tools of our trade. Um, the problem is there's a myriad of choices uh, with the number of variations on the same theme. And there may be five or six wires, which are all very similar. And even in our shop here, uh, we may have four or five choices, which are all variations on the same theme. So the important thing is to recommend, uh, recognize uh, what the purpose of the wire is and the characteristics that you're going to use. Um, for most basic interventions, uh, any old wire is going to be adequate. 
but as the lesions become more complex, uh, the importance of the wire choice becomes magnified. Uh, it's important to remember that sometimes the bend you need to reach a lesion with a large retroflex circumflex might not be the same bend that you need in a wire to cross the lesion. Uh, I'm a huge fan of microcatheters. Uh, and what this does is allows a placeholder so you can get to the lesion, you can withdraw your wire, put in a new wire, different bend, different type, different shape, and then uh, may be able to wire your lesion from there. Um, wires are cheap uh, and inexpensive. And I think that uh, we should not worry so much about changing a number of wires, obviously within reason. Um, your goal is a safe and efficient case and to choose the right wires that will accomplish that. Um, just remember that we always need to go back to the workhorse wire uh, the specialty wires that we have, uh, whether they be stiff, extremely steerable, or polymer jacketed, have a mission. Uh, once that mission is accomplished, we need to change back to the safe spring coil tip wire to make certain uh, that our procedure is as safe as possible. So I want to talk a few minutes about guide wire design. Um, so guide wire basically has three characteristics you wanna think about it. Um, when you take apart these wires, they're really a marvel of design. Um, so there's the core, which is the solid inner portion of the wire. There's the coil design, which is a extremely fine wire that's wrapped around the tip. And then there's the coatings, on the wire, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, or polymer jacketed. Um, so here are a couple representative cores. Um, you can have nitinol, which is a very springy, resilient core, which is easily reshapable. Uh, it tends to be more kink resistant and have better flexibility. Uh, stainless steel wires, on the other hand, have much better shape retention. Once they're shaped out of the body, they tend to retain that shape, uh, but you cannot reform them as well. So on the bottom here, you can see two types of wire cores. Um, the upper one you can see has some graded steps here and here and here, because this core is much thinner here. You might think that this wire would have a prolapse point where it would form a nice J here and it might be a nice soft workhorse wire. This wire on the bottom, you can see, has a much beefier and straight core. So this might be an excellent support and delivery wire, but certainly the tip is not going to be as flexible uh, as the wire above. And this is just another illustration of a nice, long, smooth core taper with no abrupt changes where this wire will track nicely. Uh, some people refer to this as a parabolic grind, which is a smooth taper. This wire below has an abrupt, uh, which will tend to prolapse. So you can see when I'm wiring a curvaceous vessel um, that this wire will track better. Whereas this wire, once I get it in, the stiff part is going to actually want to go straight and prolapse that wire out and this is just another illustration of that in terms of torque and smoothness. The coils are put on the tip of the wire to maintain uh, the diameter of the wire as you're moving forward. Um, they also uh, apply torque control and minimize the whip uh, or helicoptering of the wire, if you will. Uh, and because there's some friction there, they also supply some tactile feedback. Uh, and then there are two types of wire tips. Uh, most wires are now core to tip where the core actually goes to the tip and there's a microscopic weld at the tip. Uh, some wires have a shaping ribbon uh, at the end uh, frequently, this is with a nitinol wire and a stainless steel ribbon at the end, which allows some additional tip retention. 
So shaping a guide wire uh, is kind of an art. Uh, in the initial days, they used to just come all with the same bend, but now that we have uh, advanced all the lesions that we're working on, it's nice to be able to bend the wire suitably for the lesion that you're working on. Um, so typically the guide wires advance through the introducer and gently bend the tip to the desired angle and length. Um, the nitinol wires like the Manamo and sometimes the uh, run through, there's a shaping guide that you should slide against rather than make a sharp bend. Um, and then you just gradually increase the bend. The typical wire, uh, the standard old fashioned BMW uh, is a three millimeter tip with a 45 degree bend at the end. Um, CTOs, which you've seen is a tiny little one millimeter tip uh, with a 30 degree bend. And just remember, uh, you may need a different bend to get to the lesion and a different bend to cross the lesion. Uh, so wires are cheap, dissections and failures are costly. So the coatings of the wire, you can have hydrophobic, uh, which gives you better tactile feel and friction. You can have hydrophilic, which is smoother. You get a little bit of feedback from the uh, wire tip and a little bit of friction, but not that much. And the hydrophilic coatings of these wires frequently extend back between 15 and 40 centimeters on the wire to allow easier gear delivery because we don't want friction on the wire as the gear is being delivered. So most of the coatings I'm talking about are towards the tip. And hydrophilic coatings typically are liquid activated and they become actually a gel. Uh, so sometimes these can wear off and you may notice in long cases that your wires become very sticky as this gel wears off. And then the last uh, coating is a polymer jacketed. Uh, most of these jackets are black in color uh, and they are extremely slippery and basically provide no tactile feedback. Uh, and these are pretty dangerous in terms of end vessel perforations and should always remember to change those out. And this is just a schematic in terms of lubricity and tactile feedback. It's all about friction. You may have heard of stiff wires or gram weighting of the wires. Um, there's actually a standard way to measure this, um, but it's the number of force in grams that's required to deflect the wire tip two millimeters when the wire is braced 10 millimeters from the tip. And there's actually a device, uh, a tip measurement device that you can use. Uh, and that way we can compare wire to wire with some degree of relevance. So wiring a lesion um, is all about finding the right view to expose the lesion in its appropriate length. And there's really uh, the, the simplest way uh, is to slide and steer. So wires that are very steerable in our modern era, uh, especially the ones with one-to-one uh, -one torque that have been put out by companies, um, are best worked with just pushing, turning. And then if you don't get in, you can withdraw, rotate the wire, and then re-advance. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the robotic wiring devices have an algorithm uh, where they will withdraw the wire a certain distance. They will rotate it 60 degrees and re-advance. And if you look at that algorithm uh, versus people who twirl or try to wire, uh, they actually come out equal. Um, so it's kind of interesting. We think we're much better than we are many times. The important thing is the feedback is as much visual as it is tactile. Um, and it's important to keep an eye on your wire. If you see the tip is digging in and your wire is starting to get resistance and prolapse, that's when dissections form. Uh, you want to withdraw, redirect, and then readvance. A lot of times with these soft workhorse wires, you can prolapse them. 
uh, and get a J-tip and advance them down the vessel quite easily. Uh, and that safety loop, as it's called, uh, is much less likely to cause any distal harm and is typically a nice way to leave your wire in the vessel. Um, and there's some different wiring techniques which we can get into later. Just wanna make sure we can get through most of these topics here. So difficult side branch wiring, this is uh, actually uh, one of the ways that we can get uh, wires in. The problem is the wires tend to prolapse. So we talked about wire design. So this is where you would want a long, smooth parabolic type taper to the wire. Um, you can use angled deflection catheters like the Supercross, uh, or there's a Swift Ninja, uh, and there's some other catheters that are out there. The other thing that people can do is what's called a hairpin wire technique, which I'll show in the next slide. And then the last evidence is you can actually put a deflecting balloon here uh, to prevent the wire from prolapsing down the other vessel. So this is the, the hairpin wire technique. Um, so basically it's using a microcatheter. You take a hydrophilic wire. Uh, so this is typically done with a, a whisper or a Cyan Black or a Fielder FC. You put a 180 degree bend on the wire and then you insert that wire retroflexed into the vessel. You can do this by wiring the main vessel uh, and using a dual lumen catheter as well. It's a nice way to get the wire there. So what happens is you advance this looped wire through the vessel. And then once the distal tip passes the entrance, then you pull this wire back and it wires down. You will advance your microcatheter over that tip uh, and then you're into where you need to be. Uh, there are different wire techniques we use for CTOs. Um, there's kind of a drilling technique, which is just what it sounds like, uh, rotating uh, the wire back and forth. Uh, it is not drilling by spinning, by continuously rotating in a clock or counterclockwise direction. Uh, if your tip is fixed, uh, that's an excellent way to break uh, the wire and evolve coronary trash. Um, there is penetration wires, which is simply taking a stiff wire, maximizing your backup and pushing. Uh, and then there's the push and torque with some of the very steerable stiff wires, uh, which is kind of like uh, sliding and turning, um, but very deliberate and direct motions. Uh, the important thing in CTOs, and we can talk about that in the CTO talk, is not to get stuck in one technique. Uh, if things are not working, it's either you, the gear, or the lesion. There's only one thing that you can change, and that's the gear at that point. Um, so move quickly through your algorithms. Uh, with multiple wires, again, similar to the guide extensions, you have to remember to keep them separate uh, and prevent wire wrap. Uh, typically, uh, you can go superior to inferior down the table or lateral to medial, uh, but that way you'll always remember which wire is which. Um, there are fancy, expensive guide wire separators, but you can simply use a piece of gauze, and if you want to label them with the marker pen, you can do that. Um, so there are basically five categories of guide wires, the workhorse wires, which in our lab is typically run through, uh, or Manamo, uh, supportive wires, which we use such as uh, Grand Slam, uh, or the, um, blanking on the name, the excess. Uh, jacketed wires such as Cyan Black, Fielder FC, uh, Pilots Whisper, Gladius Mongo, penetrating wires such as the Gaia series, uh, Confianzas, Hornets, and Estados, uh, 
and some of the specialty wires uh, like the wiggle wire that we talked about. So workhorse wires are safe and simple. They have a soft spring coil atraumatic tip. They have very low but not zero perforation risk. And remember the risk of perforation is really with respect to two things. Number one is the lubricity of the wire. So jacketed wires perforate. And number two is the tip stiffness. But you can make a very soft tip wire very stiff by bringing a microcatheter or balloon uh, to the end of that wire and pushing on it. So even a workhorse wire can perforate uh, if you have balloons all the way towards the end. Uh, nitinol wires that we have, which are soft and reshapable, typically the uh, run-through in our lab or the Manamo, uh, the very steerable composite core wires are Samurai and uh, Cyan Blue. Um, the hydrophilic wires that we've talked about, the Samurai RC, the Sion, or even the Suo, and then some of the jacketed wires below. Um, but the key is to find a wire that you're comfortable with uh, and use that wire. Um, the supportive wires that we talked about, um, Grand Slam, Iron Man, Mailman, um, typically are used to support gear to get to the lesion if there is significant uh, tortuosity, but they do not track well. So sometimes you'll need to exchange for a microcatheter to get these there. Jacketed wires, uh, the coils that usually provide the tactile friction and resistance are covered by a hydrophilic polymer jacket that needs to be wet. Um, they track excellently through tortuosity. Think of this like the glide wire. Uh, they're excellent for difficult crossing through stent struts, uh, knuckling in the subintimal space. Um, they don't perforate when they're knuckled much, uh, but if they're straight, uh, they can perforate through the ends of vessels very well. Uh, so it's again, switch out for your workhorse wire. Penetrating wires are, stiff uh, and we talked about uh, the Confianzo Hornet and Estado series. Uh, some of the specialty wires, uh, the Suo and the wiggle wire, I just want to talk about the wiggle wire for a second. So you'll see here the sinusoidal curves in the tip of the wire um, and that will actually help to lock on. Um, this schematic is actually not very good. The curves are much larger up and down uh, than typically depicted here. Um, specialty wires also, we talked about rotational atherectomy, viper and externalization wires when you need them. Um, microcatheters I wanna spend a bit of time on. Uh, microcatheters are great. They allow you a much better environment to pass your wire. Uh, it's straight, it's supportive, it transmits your torque much better and allows you to cross much more difficult lesions uh, without uh, having issues uh, with uh, helicoptering or steerability. Uh, it also allows you to remove your wire, reshape, change wires, change tips, change so that you can cross lesions. Um, microcatheters are also useful for distal contrast injections. Uh, so if you're limiting contrast, you wanna see the vessel, uh, you can inject contrast through the microcatheter. Uh, you can also deliver drugs, uh, adenosine, epinephrine, et cetera. Um, there are dual lumen catheters uh, that can also be used to do this so that you don't have to lose your wire when you inject. And the other thing that these are very good for is actually dilation of small channels uh, to allow passage of balloons and other equipment. So very frequently, we would not be able to necessarily get a balloon across a CTO, uh, but these torquable microcatheters will spin across the CTO, uh, dilate it, and then make it much easier for balloons to pass. 
So there's different kinds of microcatheters. So there's microcatheters, which you can just use push that are not torquable and should not be spun, the Caravel and the Fine Cross. Um, if you spin these and the tip gets fixed, it will tear off very easily. Again, leaving some coronary trash behind. Um, there are torquable, which you can clock or counter clock. This displaces the longitudinal friction into rotational friction, allowing passage of these microcatheters much easier. They are very hydrophilic and lubricated devices. Uh, and this is similar to how rotational atherectomy uh, works uh, by displacing the longitudinal friction to rotational uh, and allows you to go through things. Uh, the tips tend to be welded on very tight and they do not break off easily, although they can uh, if you continue to rotate in the same direction and your tip is fixed. Um, the dual lumen catheters, uh, Sasuke is the one that we have here, uh, and I'll show you a cartoon of that in the future. And then there's some specialty drilling microcatheters uh, with the tornus, uh, the turnpike spiral or the turnpike gold, uh, and angled catheters such as the Supercross, the Venture, uh, and Swift Ninja. So microcatheters uh, come in all shapes uh, and stiffness. So you need to choose your, excuse me, <clears throat> you need to choose your catheter based on your desired job. Uh, so most of us, uh, just for exchanging things, would use either a Caravel or a Fine Cross. Um, the uh, Corsair or Turnpike catheters are torquable, uh, tend to be uh, a little bit more expensive. But if you're going to use them to cross lesions where there's going to be resistance, they're typically more favorable than the Caravel or the Fine Cross. Uh, and then the uh, heavy duty catheters, such as the Turnpike Gold, uh, to try to get through lesions that you cannot cross. Uh, and they also will modify the plaque. Uh, the catheter at the hub, as I'm showing you here. So this is a little cartoon of how to rotate a microcatheter here. Where it was. Turning the catheter at the hub, as I'm showing you here. Now it's not enough to do that with your right hand because to help facilitate transmitting the torque, you need to take these two fingers and it's a two finger maneuver. It's not a one finger that people often get wrong. These two fingers together roll with your thumb and in the same direction that you're turning the catheter, you're turning simultaneously. And a lot of times you'll put a couple turns in with your right hand and then you'll help facilitate it by rolling with your left hand. Two turns with my right hand, facilitate. And often we'll do this simultaneously all while I'm fixing the position of the wire with these two fingers. If you've gone a certain number of turns in one direction and the catheter is not moving, if it's a bi-directional bi -directional torquable catheter, you then start to turn in the other direction. And while you're trying to advance the catheter, if the catheter is not moving, one thing we coach physicians to do is spin the catheter faster because these often stall because doctors are turning them very slowly. And typically, if you just turn them faster, the more number of rotations, the more likely you are to get the catheter to go. A certain number of turns in one direction doesn't go, a certain number of turns in the other direction. And you slowly iterate. And as you're actually trying to advance the microcatheter, as you're turning it, these two fingers in my left hand are very slowly advancing it. And you pretty much push it until you start to see the guide kick out or guide buckle. So we're turning and advancing, turning and advancing, and pushing the catheter through the stenosis or around the tortuous anatomy. Um, so we talked about that um, microcatheter removal. This is a, a an art. So you can do what's called hydroplane or tantos. You can take a syringe with saline uh, or the indeflator uh, and inflate it to push the catheter out. You have to remember that you need the right wire at the tip, preferably with a safety loop at the end uh, so that it will not shoot forward out the catheter tip through into the vessel. It's much more safe uh, to use a trapper or a trap balloon to trap it out. Um, the other thing that you can do uh, 
uh, is use the wiggle wire because the sinusoidal curves will anchor the wire to keep the wire in place as you slowly pull the microcatheter out. Um, this is just a little bit about construction of microcatheters and some steerable microcatheters. I know we're kind of closing on to time. Um, this is the dual lumen microcatheter. Um, so what you'll see here is the catheter is placed over this distal wire. There's a second port, uh, which allows you to put out another wire. This is another way of increasing your support for the wire uh, and increasing your stiffness. It is excellent to access side branches. It is extremely helpful in bifurcation stenting to access across uh, the stent to get your second wire in in the correct position. Um, also very helpful to make sure that you are not doing any abluminal wiring underneath the initial stent uh, that you've just potted. Uh, you can't follow this wire, so this needs to be trapped out and removed carefully, um, but it is a very helpful technique. I think most of you ex experienced those. This is the Sasuke, uh, so it has a four millimeter flexible tip and about six and a half millimeters from the tip is the exit for the over the wire port. You can also use this for delivering drugs through this over the wire port or injecting contrast. And this is just an example we use for the dual lumen microcatheter. You can see the hydrophilic wire going in and then it is pulled back up here. So I'll just play this again, wire going forward, pulling back, wires the side branch. So in summary, uh, it's important to anticipate the challenges of the case and address them at the start before you get there. Um, very rarely have I ever heard anyone say we had too much support. Uh, so I think uh, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Um, you should learn how to make aggressive guides safe. Uh, you need to define the task at hand and choose the appropriate wire for the job, and then always de-escalate to a workhorse wire. Anytime you're having difficulties wiring things, remember microcatheters make wires better, and dual lumen catheters also will do the same thing. Uh, it's important to stay flexible and don't be wedded to an idea. If something has not worked several times, it's time to change. Uh, don't get stuck in a rut. Um, I think that's it. I don't know if there's any questions uh, or comments or things that we should address in the future. If you have time, could you please talk about um, guide catheter guides with side holes for osteolesions? When would like would you use that, or is that like give does that give you a false sense of security? Sure. I mean, I think uh, guide catheters with side holes. You need to know that your pressure monitoring is whatever the side holes are reaching. So if you cork a vessel with side holes, you're going to measure the aortic pressure through those side holes. In addition, if you inject a corked catheter with side holes, you're going to have a pressure relief through those side holes, but you can still dissect a vessel very easily. So my tendency is typically not to use side holes. Uh, some people like them for osteolesions and feel that there you can get adequate flow uh, through those two tiny little ports uh, to keep the vessel becoming ischemic. I don't think that's the case. I tend not to use them, um, but I think that's a personal choice that other people very much like to use them. Thank you.
That's a great review, Glenn. Every time I listen to this, I learn something new. Thank you so much for, for doing this. There are no other questions. Uh, we can conclude today's conference. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks again.